This is the day which the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Good morning, everyone. I am Father DJ, your associate rector. It's my pleasure to welcome y'all to this service of worship here at Holy Trinity. I want to invite y'all to stand at this time and crack open those blue hymnals and sing with me our opening hymn number 436. Lift up your heads, ye mighty gates, 436. Our service of Holy Eucharist, Rite 2, begins on page 355 of the Book of Common Prayer, or can be found printed in your service bulletin. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen.
Lord be with you. Let us pray, kneeling. O Lord, mercifully receive the prayers of your people who call upon you and grant that they may know and understand what things they ought to do and also may have grace and power faithfully to accomplish them. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated for the readings. With God's help, David has won battles over the Philistines, but in one, they captured the ark. While it was in their hands, the Philistines suffered a plague which they blamed on the ark, and so returned it to Israel. A reading from the second book of Samuel. David again gathered all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000. David and all the people with him set out and went to Baal, Judah, to bring up from there the ark of God, which is called by the name of the Lord of hosts, who was enthroned on the cherubim. They carried the ark of God on a new cart and brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill. Uzzah and Ahio, the sons of Abinadab, were driving the new cart with the ark of God, and Ohio went in front of the ark. David and all the house of Israel were dancing before the Lord with all their might, with songs and lyres and harps and tambourines and castanets and cymbals. So David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obededom to the city of David with rejoicing. And when those who bore the ark of the Lord had gone six paces, he sacrificed an ox and a fatling. David danced before the Lord with all his might. David was girded with a linen ephod. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of the trumpet. As the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Michael, daughter of Saul, looked out the window and saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, and she despised him in her heart. They brought the ark of the Lord and set it in its place, inside the tent that David had pitched for it, and David offered burnt offerings and offerings of well-being before the Lord. When David had finished offering the burnt offerings and the offerings of well-being, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord of hosts and distributed food among all the people, the whole multitude of Israel, both men and women, to each a cake of bread, a portion of meat, and a cake of raisins. Then all the people went back to their homes. The word of the Lord. <laughs> Please join me in reading Psalm 24 as printed in your bulletin. The earth is the Lord's and all that is in it, the world and all who dwell therein. For it is he who founded it upon the seas and made it firm upon the rivers of the deep. Who can ascend the hill of the Lord and who can stand in his holy place? Those who have clean hands and a pure heart, who have not pledged themselves to falsehood nor sworn by what is a fraud. They shall receive a blessing from the Lord and a just reward from the God of their salvation. Such is the generation of those who seek him, of those who seek your face, O God of Jacob. Lift up your head, O gates. Lift them high, O everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty, the Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates. Lift them high, O everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is he, this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. Paul gives thanks to God for the spiritual blessings which are bestowed on the Christian by virtue of baptism. He also exhorts his readers to recognize the purpose of these blessings of the Christian life, to live to praise of God's glory. A reading from the letter of the, to the Ephesians. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, just as he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him in love. He destined us for adoption as children through Jesus Christ, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace that he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and insight, he has made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure that he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time, to gather up all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In Christ, we have also obtained an inheritance, having been destined according to the purpose of him who accomplishes all things according to his counsel and will, so that we, who were the first to set our hope on Christ, might live for the praise of his glory. In him, you also, when you had heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and had believed in him, were marked with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit. This is the pledge of our inheritance toward redemption as God's own people to the praise of his glory. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand for the reading of the Holy Gospel and for the hymn. Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord Christ. King Herod heard of Jesus and his disciples, for Jesus' name had become known. Some were saying, John the baptizer has been raised from the dead, and for this reason these powers are at work in him. But others said, it is Elijah. And others said, it is a prophet like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. For Herod himself had sent men who arrested John, bound him, and put him in prison on account of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because Herod had married her. For John had been telling Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to kill him. But she could not, for Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he protected him. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he liked to listen to him. But an opportunity came when Herod, on his birthday, gave a banquet for his courtiers and officers and for the leaders of Galilee. When his daughter Herodias came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. And the king said to the girl, Ask me for whatever you wish, and I will give it. And he solemnly swore to her, Whatever you ask me, I will give you even half of my kingdom. She went out and said to her mother, What should I ask for? She replied, The head of John the baptizer. Immediately, she rushed back to the king and requested, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. The king was deeply grieved, Yet out of regard for his oaths and for the guests, he did not want to refuse her. 
Immediately, the king sent a soldier of the guard with orders to bring John's head. He went in and beheaded him in the prison, brought his head on a platter, and gave it to the girl. Then the girl gave it to her mother. When his disciples heard about it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be always acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. I've had a moment of inspiration this morning. Based upon our reading from 2 Samuel, I've decided to make an important liturgical change to our worship. No more cross, no more torches. From now on, when we start the service, I'll just be wearing my alb and I'll be dancing down the aisles like King David. What do we say? I think RJ won't mind that change while he's gone. Let's sacrifice an ox in every six paces while we're at it. What do you think? I won't quite do something that foolish, but I will say that I have done some things in my past that might be regarded as foolish. And why did I do them? Because I thought it might impress somebody. We've all been there, I think, at one point or another. What's the most foolish thing that you've ever done to make someone like you? When I was a senior in high school, there was a girl I had a crush on, and in order to kind of get myself closer to her, I learned to dye a strand of my bangs hot pink. I don't know why I thought that would work. It didn't, and it looked hideous. So much so that I just buzzed the whole thing off and uh, just let it start all over again. If you don't believe me, you can ask my wife, because that's how I looked when we first met. I hope and pray that none of us have done anything quite as foolish as King Herod did in our gospel lesson in order to save face or make people like us. Our gospel lesson today is an unusual one to be read in public worship. It's odd because it almost it hardly mentions Jesus at all. He's not the focus of it. It's odd because the way St. Mark tells the story of John's death, it's almost as an aside, as if he thought of it at the last moment. The way John dies is so arbitrary, so random, so on a whim, and so surreal with that whole head on a platter thing. And it's bizarre, almost hard to believe. There are lots of details about this story that make us raise our eyebrows. The inciting incident for this whole thing is Herod's daughter dancing in front of the guests and pleasing them, whatever that may mean. But I think at the center of this story is this character of Herod. And I think you get a real insight into how his mind works. Herod 
by the way, this is not the same Herod at the beginning of Matthew's gospel, the one who gives directions to the wise men when Jesus is born, the one who then tries to kill all the baby boys in Bethlehem. That Herod is this Herod's father. That Herod, King Herod, died, and when he died, his realm was divided. And Herod, this Herod, Herod Antipas, got the portion that covered Galilee. This Herod, as bad as his father was, was half the man his father was. He was weak. He was ineffective. He was very concerned with what both his Roman overlords and, as you can see, his friends and courtiers and his wife would think of him. Now, interestingly, this Herod is not a completely black and white figure. He puts John in prison because John has questioned the morality of his marriage to his, well, the lady who had been his sister-in-law. And yet, despite that, it says that Herod recognizes John's place as a holy and a righteous man. It says that Herod fears him, that is, he reveres him. It even says that although he was perplexed to hear him, he enjoyed listening to John's preaching. Herod is this close, perhaps. This close. But because he's so concerned with what people think of him, because when his daughter dances and makes everyone happy and has a good time at his birthday party and when he makes this foolish oath in front of everyone and when his wife asks for this one thing as a result, Herod feels he has no choice but to save face. And in order to save face, he will even go so far as to have this holy man, this man whom he respects, metaphorically thrown under the bus and literally have his head put on a silver platter. That is the tragic absurdity at the center of this story. It was an honor for John in one way to give his life for the glory of God, and we know for sure that John the Baptist ended up in a much better position than Herod. We can only pray that Herod might have had a change of heart later in his life. But one other thing I'm struck by as I read this gospel story is the striking parallels that I see with our Old Testament story from 2 Samuel. They're both about kings. Herod is the illegitimate king. The weak and ineffective one, David, is the true king chosen by God long before. A, a man after God's own heart, the Bible says. In both cases, we have very different kinds of men. Herod is so overly concerned with what people will think of him, with his reputation. David is the king of Israel and the king of not giving a flip what people think about him. He's out here dancing in front of the ark wearing nothing but essentially something like this white robe and just not caring what he looks like. His poor wife, Michael, is over here watching him like, dear God, he's making a fool of himself. I don't know whether he was just a bad dancer or whether she was concerned about the dignity of the office or what, but she looks at him and she despises him, but David does not care. And finally, I look at these two stories. And in the gospel story, a dance leads to death. It leads to ugliness, vengeance, bloodshed. The end of the story is the burying of a headless body. But when we look at our Old Testament passage, another dance leads to life, joy, abundance. David offers thanksgiving sacrifices to God. 
David blesses the people with his words, and then he blesses the people with his deeds. He gives them food. They all, they all have this abundance, these fine raisin cakes even, this meat, which, you know, meat was really a delicacy back then. So these people are really being blessed by David. I am marked by the contrast between these two things. Herod's daughter dances merely to amuse his guests. David dances because he's bringing the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem. Now, we all see in Indiana Jones, we know what the Ark of the Covenant is, right? It's that golden box with the two winged figures on it, right? It was built while the Israelites were in the wilderness. Unlike what they say in that movie, it was not a battery. What it was was a physical symbol, a visual locus of the presence of God among his people. Inside the box were the Ten Commandments given by God to Moses, along with a jar full of the manna that rained from heaven to feed the Israelites, and finally the staff that belonged to, Aaron, to Moses' brother Aaron, a staff which God made to bud miraculously with flowers. This box is filled, this treasure box, with reminders of God's past provision and mercy and deliverance and presence. It is a physical reminder that God is still with his people. And so it's for great reason that David and his friends dance for joy when they bring this physical symbol of the presence of God into Jerusalem. What the ark was as a type, as a shadow, we know as a reality. Jesus Christ is the one in whom the fullness of Godhead, of deity, dwells, as St. Paul says. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and tabernacled among us. That's what St. John says about Jesus in chapter 1 of his gospel. We know the reality to which the ark was pointing as a foreshadowing. And now that reality is here with us. Here with us in the gathered assembly. Here with us in the word proclaimed. Here with us in the sacrament which we receive at the altar. David danced with joy before the ark, and behold, something greater than the ark is here. Something with an even greater reason for us to be joyful and thankful. One of the reasons to be joyful and thankful about the gospel that we celebrate and that we proclaim is that it frees us from many things. And one of the things that it liberates us from is the worry about caring so much what other people think. One of my colleagues back in Dallas, Deacon Phil Snyder, once said something in a sermon that I will never forget. He said that the world's love is always conditional. It always comes with strings attached. The world says, I love you, but, I love you, but, even the best of human relationships have that. God looks at us, looks deep into each heart. As our colleague says, he, to him all hearts are open, all desires known, and from him no secrets are hid. God knows the very deepest darkest parts of ourselves, even better than we do. God looks at that, and what does God say? I love you, period. End of story. No conditions, no strings attached, no ifs, ands, or buts. Nothing you need to do to earn it. 
nothing you need to strive for. How much of our lives, friends, is spent striving and trying to get into people's good graces? How much of our lives do we spend wondering what we can say or do to get ourselves into this or that social circle or get ourselves into this or that club or group of friends? How much of our lives do we spend worrying about what we say or do and if it will offend people? How much of our lives do we spend stepping on eggshells as softly as we can? How much of our lives do we fret that one slight wrong word or deed might cause offense? Friends, that is not the case with God. With God, nothing can separate us from his love. And the ultimate proof that God gave of that is that truth that we know in John 3, 16. How did God so love the world? How did he show it? How did he prove it? By sending his only son, by giving him as a sacrifice, so that all who believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And that love, friends, that love is made real to us. That love is given and available to us. That love stands with open arms ready to receive us. No matter who we are, no matter what we've been through, no matter what we've done or what's been done to us, God stands with open arms ready to receive us. Friends, when we know that love, when we are in Christ, we live that life that St. Paul speaks of in his letter to the Ephesians today, that life that God destined us to live, a life where we can not only love God and love our neighbor, but let ourselves enjoy being loved by God and loved by our neighbor, even if it's imperfect sometimes. We are set free to let ourselves be loved as we are, not as we think we ought to be or as we think other people think we ought to be. We are set free to live transformed lives. We are set free, God willing to make a difference. We are set free to have joy and life and abundance. We are set free to let our spirits dance with abandon before the ark of our heart. And between the cherubim of that ark dwells the Lord of hosts, to whom the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be all honor and glory now and forever. Amen. Please stand and join me in proclaiming our faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father of the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please kneel as we say together the prayers of the people.
a member of the church may truly and humbly serve you, that your name may be glorified by all. We pray for all bishops, priests, and deacons, that they may be faithful ministers of your word and sacraments. We pray for all who govern and hold authority in the nations of the world, that there may be justice and peace on the earth. Give us grace to do your will in all that we undertake, that our work may find favor in your sight. Have compassion on those who suffer from any grief or trouble, especially Poppy Ann Bailey, Regina Simmons, Karen Freya, Ryan Redgrave, Marshall Lawson, Julianne Davies, Mark Easy, Diana Gardner, Bill Richards, and Patty Koch, that they may be delivered from their distress. Give to the departed eternal rest. May the perpetual light shine upon them. We praise you for your saints who have entered into joy, especially Patrick Shields. May we also come to share in your heavenly kingdom. Let us pray for our own needs and for those of others. We continue to pray for all those affected by the disaster in Surfside, for the continued recovery for all families and friends and for all the deceased. O Lord, our God, accept the fervent prayers of your people. In the multitude of your mercies, look with compassion upon us and all who turn to you for help. For you are gracious, O lover of souls, and to you we give glory, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Please stand. The peace of the Lord be always with you. You may be seated. Once again, I am Father DJ Griffin, the new associate rector here, and it really is a pleasure to be with you all here this morning. Pleasure to be with you all here in Palm Beach County, and I am so excited about the wonderful things that are going to be happening here at Holy Trinity in the months and years to come. I have one announcement uh, regarding our outreach project coming up this Saturday, July 17th. Uh, we are working with the Farm Worker Children's Center to do a back to school drive through bash. We'll be doing that, as I said, this Saturday from uh, 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. And Farm Worker Children's Center serves kids uh, from, I mean, elementary school through high school provides them all kinds of benefits. What they're asking for help with is school supplies, things like lime paper, markers, colored pencils, whiteboard markers, etc., etc., etc. If you want more details on that, go to our website at holytrinitywpb.org and add slash outreach to the end of that, and you'll see all the details that you need there. This is a ministry that Holy Trinity has been partnered with for a long time as well, so it's our pleasure to continue to serve these, our neighbors. As we move into Holy Communion, uh, I remind us again that although we've eased many of our restrictions, uh, we are still not 
permitted to give the common cup yet. So you, when you come up, if you wish to receive, you will receive in one kind in the bread. And in that bread, you will receive the fullness of the sacrament and the full benefit of the sacrament of the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, if you do not wish to receive communion, I still invite you to come forward and cross your arms across your chest, and I'll be happy to give you a blessing. And as you come forward, you will notice our offering boxes here on either side. I invite you to give as you feel led. And uh, as Father R.J. always points out, God loves a cheerful giver. We have a, an offertory hymn as well to sing. That is 686. I invite you to remain in your seats as we sing that together and move into the next portion of our service. Ascribe to the Lord the honor due his name. Bring offerings and come into his courts. Our service continues with Eucharistic Prayer A, which can be found on page 361 of the Book of Common Prayer or in your service bulletin. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, for you are the source of light and life. You made us in your image and called us to new life in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name.
Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love you made us for yourself. And when we have fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith, Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension. We offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people, the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also, that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace, and at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia! Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Alleluia! The gifts of God for the people of God, take them in remembrance that Christ died for you, and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
on page 366 of the Book of Common Prayer or in your service bulletin. Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of your Son and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now, Father, send us out to do the work you have given us to do, to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord. To him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, be honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. Please stand. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God, and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father of the Son and the Holy Spirit, be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen. Let us go forth in the name of Christ. Thanks be to God.